I have fallen into the trap of thinking that when it comes to training, pushing harder at a higher intensity gives you more bang for your buck. If you want to improve, you've got to train hard. Short on time, just train harder. Do all the high intensity stuff and cut out the rest. Right, wrong. As many of you will already have realized, that approach will only get you so far. And if you keep pushing, you'll end up sore and tired and slow. And that was me. Even after all these years, I fell into that trap again. So a friend very casually suggested that I read up on the work of Dr. Inigo San Milan, who's a specialist in physiology and metabolism in health and disease based at the University of Colorado's medical school. He is also the coach of Tade Pogaccia and the head of performance at UAE Team Emirates. He believes that the benefits of lower intensity exercise are huge, essential even, not just to performance, but to health and well-being, to life in general, in fact. I'm delighted to say that Dr. Sam Milan was able to join us for a video interview. And all of us here at GCN were so interested by what he had to say, we've left the interview almost in its entirety for you to watch as well. Inigo, thank you so much for fitting us in to your schedule. Where in the world are you at the moment? Well, thank you very much, Simon. It's my pleasure. Um, thanks for having me in, in, your, in this interview. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm now in, in Colorado trying to uh, wrap up the season and at the same time keep up with my academic activity. So trying to balance things out. So, so I've been confessing to the, to the GCM viewers that I've fallen into that trap that I think a lot of us make where I prioritized high intensity training and I got into a bit of a rut. I certainly didn't get mm. fit. I got very slow and tired. So can you, can you sort of explain how riding slower fundamentally can make you faster? Yeah, it, it, it is. Yeah, exactly. You, you're, you're totally right, right? It's, it's a concept that has been going on for, for many years because yeah, intuitively, right, we, 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 we tend to train harder and do a lot of intervals and sprints because this is where we win races. Or people win races. I haven't won races forever, right? But anyway, that's where people win races in the high intensity, right? So intuitively, people train there. The, the, the problem is, is that uh, cycling and uh, in general uh, sports or muscle bioenergetics uh, don't work that way. Of course, you win the races at the high intensity pace, but for that, you need to have a very good solid um you know, like a aerobic base, uh, to put it that way, and, and lactate clearance capacity. So one of the things that happens is that at high intensity, you use a lot of glucose for exercise, um, uh, for, for energy purposes. Now, always, every time you use glucose, you produce lactate, right? And, 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 and you don't uh, use uh, fat. At high intensity, is uh, you, you use zero grams of fat per minute, right? So, so that means that, yeah, you need to be more effective, uh, metabolically speaking. So one of the key things is to clear lactate. So the way to clear lactate is to... Uh, uh, um, develop the slow twitch muscle fibers better, uh, which are the ones that clear lactate. Lactate is producing the fast twitch muscle fibers, which are the ones that you deploy when you do high intensity uh, um, exercises like the competition or, or training, high intensity. But uh, that lactate from the fast twitch muscle fiber has to uh, uh, travel to the adjacent muscle fiber, the slow twitch in mitochondria of those slow twitch and there be uh, utilized for energy purposes. For that, it's key to develop those slow twitch muscle fibers, that they're going to be the recipients, right, of that lactate. If you don't develop those muscle fibers, lactate keeps building up, building up, building up. So this is why uh, the, the, the lower intensities are, are key, because uh, those, those slow twitch muscle fibers are the assistants to, to these fast twitch muscle fibers, and the best way to develop them is to do to, to specifically stimulate those through training, right? Uh, and for that, the lower intensity, that, that's where you're going to be deploying uh, these muscle fibers, as opposed to just training at high intensities, you, you, you keep stimulating those fast twitch muscle fibers, right? They become very efficient uh, and, and what is called very glycolytic. They use all the glucose very efficiently, the turbo, you, right? The, the, the turbo works really well, but then you need to, to 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 clear the lactate. So I guess if for people that have got power meters, they'll be sort of familiar with their zones. But is there any way of helping someone work out what is a high intensity effort and what 
correspondingly is a lower intensity effort. What are the kind of, what does it feel like? The best way obviously is to do a, a metabolic test in the laboratory, or even, even you can do a field test. And for that, I use lactate a lot. It's, it's, it's a great surrogate to, to see a, a mitochondrial function and whether you're using fat or carbohydrates and, 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 and calculate the intensities really well. If you don't have access to this, uh, um, it's not as easy, but I would say that going by the feelings, you know, it's going to uh, be very accurate, more accurate than 220 minus your age and those formulas for heart rate or even in FTP. FTPs, uh, many times they fail quite a bit uh, in, the, in, in, in the sense that, that, that they're not might be very accurate to calculate your zone two out of an FTP, right? Because it's a fixed percentage, you know, it might, might be uh, off, right? Because when you want to calculate a zone two, when we talk about lower intensities, we don't, we don't talk about just a ride in the park, right? Um, if, if, you, if you ask, you know, world-class athletes or some of the, the, uh, the, 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 the top cyclists that I, that I coach, like Pogacar, uh, Ayuso, Almeida, Right. Their zone two is, is they go at it, right? It's not a right in the park, right? But for someone who's maybe not as developed, might be a lower intensity, everybody's different, right? But the way I put it is like, if you if you can maintain a conversation like you and I are doing now on the bike, you're definitely doing zone one, okay. right? Uh, if it's uh, difficult to maintain the conversation, but you can keep up with that, uh, you might be around that zone two. Uh, if okay. you have a hard time, like a really difficult to maintain the conversation, uh, you're already entering in more of the glycolytic uh, pathways. This old school um, uh, thing of the the, the, the the talking test, it works really well. Um, how much zone two training should you do then? And I appreciate that's probably a difficult question because what Bagantia does and you know what what an ordinary person would do would be very different. But maybe as a proportion of your total riding in a week yeah you know how much should you devote to it i would say that a uh, minimum to to improve uh you know those adaptations you need three days a week you know two days you maintain uh but if you need to improve you need three days a week uh, so uh, uh sometimes even four you know so between three or four ideally but again it depends on which time of the season and which block um and also as as the season gets closer and closer or the races get closer and closer, you need to, and you have done a very good um, a block of zone two, for example, you definitely need to also stimulate high intensity because at the end of the day, as we said from the very beginning, right, that's where you win the races. When, when people tell me, oh, you all you do is zone two, like, no, you know, ask ask my riders when they do the, the zone four training rides, right? It is really hard also uh, because they're very high intensity glycolytic uh, workouts where you stimulate those pathways and what about for for like a weekend warrior so someone like myself uh i'm, I'm looking at turning 40 next year I, like i was fit i'm sort of holding on to it but i'm i'm a time crunch cyclist i'm your typical yeah. time poor cyclist so if you've only got five hours a week that's where it feels like you know riding along in zone two isn't doesn't feel as constructive. It might not seem that um, um, constructive, uh, you know, uh, but it, it, you know, it, one thing that for weekend warriors, right, you don't need four or five hours of some two. So that, that's where we, 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 I see, you know, that uh, doing like three to four days a week, uh, zone two works really well. Uh, then, uh, um, so let's say that you have uh, four days a week to train, you know, uh, so yeah, you can do three days a week, uh, zone two, and uh, even if you have an hour and a half and or an hour and 15 minutes and, and towards the end, you can do some high intensity. And going back to what a lot of people think is like, oh, I only have an hour and, and a half to train each day. So I'm going to go boom, 100 percent at it. Yeah, you, you might you might see like a, a, a fast but not super high improvement, but you're going to plateau. And eventually you're going to um, deteriorate, you know, because of what we were saying, you develop the glycolytic fibers very well. So that turbo wow looks really good, but eventually you're not supporting, you know, you're not developing the other fibers. But it's really good to know actually that you don't need loads of time in order to be able to, to feel the benefits and still get the fun ride in at the weekend. I was also really interested to hear you say that you can do a bit of high intensity at the end of your zone two rides. And that's another place where I've kind of been a little bit um, unsure as to how best to do that. So for mm -hmm. example, if I go out and ride, 
you know, I can stick in zone two, but it's always tempting to just get out of the saddle and, you yeah. know, put another 150 watts on the pedals to get over a little rise or accelerating away from a stop sign or some traffic lights. Mm -hmm. Is that detrimental to your zone two training? That's a great question. Yeah, if it's like a little hill, you know, obviously don't get off the bike and walk, right? Because, oh, my heart rate is this or my power output. Like I, no, I mean, you, you, you can do that, right? But uh, try not to do, you know, not go over or not get into your lactate threshold or going over it. Um, because once you 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 engage that and en those energy systems, right, um, you start producing a lot of lactate. You start producing a lot of what's called catecholamines, and the whole uh, hormonal right and metabolic uh, response it's altered. So it, it might take you a good thirty minutes to go back to basis to a baseline or twenty minutes, right. Uh, so that you can kind of stabilize again. So it's like a shock to the system. Are there any shortcuts here? Like if you do, you know, faster training, for example, or if you set off and you, you say, rode at a slightly higher intensity, to, you know, to stretch your muscles in a different way and then settle back into zone two and you get through that 30 minute period where you sort of, your body's readjusting. Are there any ways you can, you can effectively get more out of the time you've got? From my experience, it's, it's, it's important to stick to, to, to those basics. Um, I mean, I know fasting is, it's a big deal. It's been a big deal. I mean, forever. I mean, all these things, they come back and forth, right? These concepts like the fasting. I'm, I'm 51 years old. And, but when I was, uh, 16, when I started racing, I was doing fasting already. Uh, I'm talking about 35 years ago because our, our cycling coach uh, uh, had, had heard about a coach from France who used to advise their cyclists to, to, to train uh, in, in a fasting state. So we did it, right? So only, anyway, there's a concept that it might seem new, but you know, it's like the heart rate uh, also, right? Like uh, 10, 15 years ago, everybody wanted to kill heart rate. Right, and it was all, all watts, and heart rate was very old school for sure. Right, I was fighting, 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 you know, back then to hey, you need both, right? Um, and now heart rate is back. It's funny you say about um, things coming back from the past, and you know, when I was younger, I would very much do my base training partly because I had more time to do it, but I suspect yeah. unwittingly I was doing a lot of zone two training there. Mm -hmm. um, it feels it feels like by doing sort of your, your zone two stuff and your zone four stuff. It's, it's like that polarized training that yeah. people have long advocated. Is there any merit in your mind about doing, you know, training in those intensities in the middle, basically, your kind of your zone threes and, and, and that kind of intensity? Because a lot of people are, are doing that in zone three, right? Um, I mean, to me, it's about uh, targeting uh, bioenergetics and energy systems, right? So this is why I would say, what, what, which energy system you want to stimulate today? You want to still uh, stimulate the oxidative metabolism, which would be your zone two, or you want to stimulate the glycolytic metabolism, which is your zone four, right? Or you want to sprint your, you want to uh, stimulate your sprint metabolism, right? Uh, which is sprint training, right? But zone three and zone one, zone one is more a recovery day, right? Your coffee ride. Right? And zone three is something in the middle where you're never there in a competition. I mean, nothing, not much moves there. In my, this is in my humble opinion, you know. So, if you, especially if you don't have much time, I think you need to be laser focused on the energy system that you want to target, and and not do something that is in the middle where not much happens there uh, at the uh, bioenergetic level and uh, uh, and uh, or at the competition level. You, you never win a race in the zone three. That's a really helpful way of thinking. Actually, it makes it very clear. Um, can I ask you, obviously, you, you coach Pogaccia and Ayuso and Almeida. How much, how, like, what's the kind of volume like for those guys doing zone two? Right. So, yeah, there are a lot of hours, you know, per week uh, of volume that we do. And, and then we, we, we reset training zones, right? And because uh, you, you might have the zone now, especially if you take like two, three weeks off, uh, you, you deteriorate, right? So your zone now, so two now, it's going to be different in a... Uh, in, in two months, for example, or in a month or in three weeks. So it doesn't, you know, that's what we do testing to, to fine tune uh, those specific intensities and continue to push. Their zone two must be so, like, it must be such incredible power outputs for mere mortals. The amount of, the amount of calories. Oh, they yeah. Burn, yeah. So, so do they have to restrict the amount of zone no, two? No, no. They just well, eat. 
they, they, they need to that's not thing it's you need to eat a lot you know and this is what we we, we have to pay a lot of attention to nutrition it's absolutely key and, and uh, this is why restricting carbohydrates uh, playing around with that you know oof, it's going to be a big artifact and it's going to interfere with with training you know and uh, so yeah and, and this is again I mean I'm, uh, I mean one thing is what what research could say right and another thing is what the real world says you know and sometimes and, and I'm saying this is a scientist you know that uh, don't always go um, uh, swear by science uh, in these areas. Uh, uh, I mean, swear by science, but not always think that science has uh, the last word. We've talked a lot about zone two training things, but but much of your work is about more important things than just cycling performance, right? Can you can you talk to us briefly about the the importance of mitochondrial function in in general health and well-being and in medicine as well because it seems like a fascinating field of research yes one of the things is like um um when i when i came to to, to the school of medicine at the university here uh, for, uh 14 years ago i i started to have a lot of interaction with with, with patients and, and 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 different departments right and and looking in in in, in metabolic diseases from cardiovascular disease to type 2 diabetes cancer and that's where, like, I started to see that um, uh, th th there is a, a lack of understanding of many mechanisms behind the pathogenesis of these diseases, right? So I always, so, and, and, and more and more people are, are the more they, they, they dig in and they do research, people are, are uh, um, um, uh, you know, stumbling upon metabolism, right, at the cellular level. So that, that's where, like, uh, we come from working with elite athletes because they, they are the perfect machines. They have the perfect metabolism and i always say that you cannot understand imperfection if you don't know perfection in the first place so these are the elite athletes so with lessons learned from elite athletes that's what i'm trying to do we can get to understand the pathogenesis of some diseases uh, where uh, mitochondrial impairment or dysfunction is at the epicenter and this is what we're seeing in in um, uh, so many diseases nowadays. So my focus now is to try to continue to understand this better. And we're, uh, yeah, we're, we're finding new things. We have a bunch of studies that we need to publish, uh, but we see that definitely, you know, the mitochondrial function is, is key. And also we were working a lot in, in cancer uh, metabolism. Uh, you know, most of the cancer research has been done uh, for decades, right? In cancer genetics, right? And, 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 you know, back in the days, they told us, oh, we're going to find the gene that is mutated, we're going to turn it off. That usually doesn't happen, right? So, so you know, the, the route through genetics uh, has been good to, to get to now do some diagnostics to see which genes might be altered, but uh, not, not to cure cancer, right? So uh, we still use the same chemotherapy and radi radiotherapy, you know, that has been, was used 40, 50 years ago. Right, so not much has changed uh, except for immunotherapy, which has been a big change in in cancer for for about 10, 15 percent of patients, but only in a small amount of tumors. And then some genetic therapies, like CAR T cells, that may work well for what's called uh, liquid tumors, like lymphomas, for example. Right, but but um, um, there's not much out there and, and targeted therapies. But um, what what we're trying to do is to target metabolism. So there are different metabolic pathways of cancer cells. They're absolutely necessary for that cancer cell to continue to grow, right? So we're trying to cut off uh, or um, um, stop some of those pathways uh, so that those cancer cells don't grow anymore. So we have, uh, we have uh, done it already in the laboratory and we have to publish this data now and also try to understand better what, 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 can, what is cancer. It's incredible, really, to, for you and your career to span such like mm -hmm. extremes of of science. Really, like I, I can see that it's linked, but it must be must be strange going from talking to Pogaccia about you know winning the Tour de France at one point, and then you know talking to patients who are suffering from cancer at the other. That must be, um, yeah, must be quite some skill set you've got. Well, I don't know. It's a passion, and and I mean at the end of the day, we're talking about metabolism, right? And uh, we can utilize it in, in multiple ways, right? But yeah, sometimes like, yeah, it's just, I, I'm talking to Tadej, you know, and uh, about what training today and boom, five minutes later, I'm 
I'm talking, I'm, I'm, we're doing an experiment with cancer cells. Thank you so much, Inigo, for your time today. It's been absolutely fascinating talking to you and, uh, and helpful as well. Some great tips that uh, I think we can all put into practice. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, much appreciated. Well, thank you very much, Simon. My, my pleasure. And yeah, just whenever you need it, uh, any, uh, any interview, here I am. I hope that it, it helped uh, some of your audience. Wow, huge thank you to Inigo for his time. As you can probably tell, I was hanging on his every word. My personal take home points from that. Firstly, the importance of doing that zone two low intensity training. Secondly, how to find that zone, the fact that you can do it whilst having a conversation but not having a normal conversation. And then also the importance of keeping that zone two work separate from any other high intensity work so that you don't get any of those hormonal changes so you actually get the maximum out of it. Then also, Inigo's point that actually zone two work isn't easy riding, and that's certainly something that I've found as well. If you sat on a turbo for an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half holding zone two, it does get pretty punchy by the end, and so I won't think of it as just pottering around easily anymore. And then lastly, was that point about fasted training and making sure you're fueling adequately. That, I think, was super interesting. I'd love to know your thoughts, though. Get involved in the comments section down below. Is there anything that you want us to do a follow-up or more of a deep dive? Get involved and give this video a big thumbs up as well.